Thank you very much, uh, Andy, Dennis, and uh, Yure, for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, when I first accepted the invitation, uh, it was back in October, and um, we were working on Ebola that time, and that probably got Yure's interest perked up. And um, luckily for all of us, uh, although it continues to be a, a, a problem, I think things are looking much better. So my talk uh, is going to be about computational epidemiology, uh, the role of big data and pervasive informatics. And uh, before I go into the details, uh, I want to acknowledge my collaborators. It's certainly not uh, something that I've done alone. This is a piece of work that spans over 20 years. And uh, a number of folks in our lab, as well as folks in other universities, uh, and also the different funding agencies. So I want to thank them for their support. Uh, <clears throat> So I have uh, decided that uh, given the diversity of the audience, I will try and keep the talk at a scientific American level. Um, I'm happy to take questions during the talk if that's easy. And we can certainly discuss it at the end of the talk. And uh, what I thought was that I'll try and have two basic goals for today's lecture. One is to give you an overview of computational epidemiology as, as a as a branch in, in science with an emphasis on computing and data science and how it helps, helps this area. Uh, I decided to do this because I think in the systems lab, uh, this might be a topic that not everybody is, is well versed with. And the second thing that I would like to illustrate through this talk is, is uh, this broad topic of computation for social good. I think this is a beautiful topical area for us as computer scientists to contribute to the to the larger societal good. And hopefully, at the end of the talk, some of you might feel interested in, and, and decide to work on this topic. And if I've done that, that would be a, uh, that would be a success for this talk. Uh, I've also tried to have maybe a little bit more in terms of words on the slides. And uh, I did it just so that uh, these slides are, if read by others at a later time, are as much as possible self-contained. Uh, so, but I'll go through it slowly. Uh, luckily, then we have a uh, time till 5.30, which I was not aware of. So I think we get enough time to discuss it. So let me start first with uh, just defining some basic terms. What is epidemics? Epidemics is really uh, uh, a situation where the num incidence, the number of folks who are falling sick, or the incidences that you're measuring in a community or region is substantially higher than what is typically observed, right? So the, 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 the definition itself is a relative term. So for instance, Ebola is now viewed as an epidemic because the number of cases up until now were very, very small compared to what we have seen so far. The term epidemiology comes from, uh, from you know, Greek words, epi and, and, and demos, and uh, basically deals with the study uh, of the distribution and determinants of health-related states and uh, tries to find ways to control the health problems that people face. The basic term has been applied in the context of uh, non-communicable diseases as well over time and also to things like malware propagation in, in, in the internet. So three, three things are important in this particular setting. One is that you're talking about distribution. So you're not talking about individual health as much as understanding population health. And that's a distinction between epidemiology and medicine, so to say. The second is your interest in causes for why this is happening, so the determinants. And finally, your interest in the application, coming up with ways to control epidemics. Computational epidemiology or mathematical epidemiology, they are closely related, is a topic where you try and use mathematical sciences and computational sciences to try and help epidemiologists address their sci scientific field. So that's, that's what uh, you know, computational epidemiology in short is. And I'll, I'll discuss these aspects in detail. So epidemics are not new to us. Um, you know, if, as least as, as old as, as, uh, as the you know, history of, of, of uh, humankind in many ways. Uh, and there is a set of good literature articles that have been cited. And I have some citations at the very end that you can take a read at. But, the good news is that uh, pandemics, which is basically epidemics at a global proportion, uh, that happened, uh, have happened quite periodically in history, uh, at least for the time being, uh, seem unlikely. 
you know, so the large, last big pandemic that happened was 1918 flu. We had other pandemics after that, but that probably was the biggest in, in the last century. By far, probably affected almost every country, every, every region uh, in the world. Um, and we think that at least in the, uh, for the time being, such, a, such an event is unlikely to occur. But uh, most people would agree that we will see a pandemic. The question is when. Uh, and the thing is that even though we have made great strides in terms of uh, finding out where the disease is starting, coming up with pharmaceutical interventions, uh, there are many new complicating factors that I believe uh, uh, make the problem of addressing or solving this, you know, controlling epidemics is, uh, is a challenging one. So what, what are the basic issues? One is that we are starting to live in cities that are larger and larger. So the second thing is that cities are getting more and more tightly packed. Uh, so the density in urban regions is growing. We also have uh, immunocompromised individuals. Uh, many more folks uh, who are older and folks who uh, who uh, who have uh, you know other other uh, other diseases or, or uh, health uh, health problems, uh, which basically makes them immunocompromised and increase the likelihood likelihood of them catching a, a, a new disease. And finally, we we have over time as we've started growing in terms of population, we've really coming up. To a situation in, in, at, at a place where we are starting to interact more and more with the environment and nature, we're sort of affecting it in, in a larger, large way. And I think Ebola is an example where this this might be playing out uh, in, in in some ways, where the boundaries of the cities is actually growing, and we are we are touching the habitat uh, of of uh, you know uh, of other 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 animals and, and species in a, in a manner that we have not done before in in in, in such large numbers. So we want to keep that in mind. And so the, the tools that we're going to try and develop, hopefully, will try and address these issues. I want to take an example from uh, Ebola, uh, the work that we have been working on. And I'll tell you a little bit more uh, about it. Uh, this has been the largest Ebola outbreak in the history. Uh, Ebola's history, as we know, started around 1970s, uh, sometime during that time. But this one has, uh, this has affected uh, a much larger region, three, three countries in, in West Africa with sporadic cases in Nigeria that sort of went there, Mali recently. Uh, but uh, it used to be that Central Africa was where Ebola outbreaks happened, but this one moved into Western Africa and, uh, and affected now at, at least 20,000 individuals. These are detected cases. The general belief is that the number of cases is far more than 20,000 and has so far caused 8,000 odd deaths. Uh, so this has got a huge uh, you know, uh, burden of disease uh, in, in terms of uh, you know, how many deaths it has caused and how many folks it, is, it has infected. Uh, moreover, the countries are actually just overcoming a, a la, you know, long uh, social uh, problem in terms of uh, civil war that was going on in these places. So you know, not only do we have this big outbreak, it's in it, countries which are relatively poor, uh, and just recovering from, from uh, earlier political and, and, and social problems and civil problems that they had. And uh, uh, actually, there's a very nice uh, you know, uh, web page that New York Times has prepared. And I, have, I look at it very, uh, very often. Folks here might want to look at it, uh, which actually outlines uh, you know, many, many issues that folks who are epidemiologists or even you know, a citizen scientists would be interested in reading. Uh, and there are basic questions that we want to study, things like, you know, how many people have been infected? Where is the outbreak? Where did it start? Uh, how do you stop it? These are all questions that we all as epidemiologists or, you know, even citizen scientists and policymakers are interested in addressing. And I think this website actually does a very good job of cataloging these questions. Um, our goal here is to study what we call real-time epidemic science. And this is becoming more and more feasible over time. And the basic idea is that you, you don't want to develop tools that are only useful during the planning phase. You know, say, for instance, preparing tools right now for a future pandemic that might happen, but really work with the policymakers and, and civil authorities and supporting them as the disease is breaking out uh, in real time. Now, this is actually a, a non-trivial problem. Uh, I think as a society we have become better at it, but I think remains a 
really big open question uh, in terms of how we bring about uh, uh, you know, changes and, and build tools and, and get policymakers to agree on, on problems of, of the scale and size. Uh, and actually, there's a very nice article in Science some time back. It was an editorial article by Feinberg and, and her, his colleague uh, about this question. And they have uh, challenged the society to try and study and build tools to study, you know, de develop tools for epidemics, um, you know, control in, in real time. So here are some questions that we have, uh, uh, you know, studied over, over a number of years uh, before. But in the context of Ebola, we've been studying them very actively. And to just give you some sense, uh, we started working on Ebola uh, approximately in, uh, in June, July timeframe, uh, working very closely with uh, you know, several federal agencies. Uh, and uh, it has been an experience of, 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 a, of a kind for us as a lab. Uh, we are an academic institution, but given what was happening on the ground, uh, the work has been very intense. And as, in, in some ways, uh, to us, to a, you know, for, for us as modelers, it's rewarding to see whether uh, to try and support policymakers. And I, I think at the end of the day, the folks on the ground deserve a lot of credit. You know, the models we make is, is one thing, but the folks who are really on the ground in these countries working out really deserve all, all the kudos from us and support from us. So this, this is actually really small work in, in terms of what these folks are doing. It's just very challenging questions. So we started supporting some of the agencies in US. Um, uh, through interagency you know, coordination meetings. Uh, and initially, the goal was simply to understand the epidemic disease parameters, you know, the, the rate at which the infection is getting, you know, trans, you know, the incubation time of the disease, uh, how the disease is getting you know, transmitted, where it might be. We started then forecasting the disease, and every week we actually give presentations where these forecasts are provided to the policymakers. Um, and, uh, as, uh, as my colleague has, has said, uh, we are actually happy to, to be proven wrong in our forecast. Our initial forecast actually uh, said the numbers are going to be much higher than what the current numbers report. And I, I personally think of this as actually very good news. Uh, and uh, partly, it's, it's very hard to figure out whether our forecasts are wrong or whether the forecast that our group and many other groups did uh, really galvanized the community to change certain habits uh, that might have cut down on, on the disease progression. And this is something Andy said in his in, introduction, where people are very important elements of this, unlike physical system, where you can really deterministically say you know, where the moon is going to be you know, in terms of its, its position. Uh, people adapt when they perceive diseases. And that's fundamentally a problem in social systems uh, and, and, and things like epidemics. So we did forecasting, site forecasting problems. We then studied um, in uh, September time frame questions related to assessing the, the chance of the disease coming to US. Uh, you might have heard of the news on, on the TV that time and, and uh, news outlets about uh, you know, cases that came to US. Uh, and luckily, things, things worked out. Uh, and it was, it was very clear as modelers that unless we did something really stupid, this is not going to you know, spread in a way that has, uh, that has spread in, in, in Liberia at that time. Uh, we have far, far uh, well-coordinated uh, system in, in place. We then studied uh, uh, efficiently allocating pharmaceuticals. Uh, now, there's no vaccine for Ebola right now, but they're in the process. There are some trials ongoing right now. We expect vaccines to come out sometime this year. Initially, the thought was that it would be uh, very soon, but I think it has been delayed some. We do expect vaccines to come out. The current number, uh, you know, trials, which are very limited, suggest that they, they might be efficacious. So we studied how vaccines could be allocated, uh, how many would might be required, uh, you know, where should they be provided, and questions of that sort. Another question we studied uh, when we were working with the uh, agencies was to allocate, uh, you know, resources in a very particular setting, which is, a, which is a, actually an operations research question, which is to do with placing emergency treatment units. So as you know, US decided to place between 10 and 20 emergency treatment units. Uh, the size and their scope was not clear early on. And we did a study to, to, to at least provide guidance in what, what sort of treatment units 
would be most useful, where would they be placed, what sort of benefits you would get, uh, some of the results were then taken in. Um, and the questions are actually non-trivial, right? For instance, you might actually intuitively feel like placing a treatment unit uh, where the disease burden is very high at, at this moment. Um, but by the time the treatment unit gets in place, uh, the disease might have moved on to some other place. So it's not obvious where to place these units. Now, if you might, you might place it in a remote place where there's no disease uh, breakout at that point of time, uh, from a social standpoint, it, it, it is not a policy that goes very well to see something that is sitting there with nobody using it. So it's actually an interesting operations research question. There have been now discussions about placing these units uh, in, a, in a manner they call uh, uh, you know, treatment units in a box. So they want to build smaller units, potentially, that can be moved as they see the disease moving through the place. Now, this is not a straightforward matter because you know, to dismantle, get the place working is, is a non-trivial issue, but something to be considered. We've been studying uh, you know, need for protective uh, gear, you know, face masks, gloves, and other things. Uh, we've also studied uh, the use of Twitter in assessing the public mood and sentiments. We had done another project before for flu, which was very successful in using Twitter data in the, in the US and Latin American countries. But we found out that you know, Twitter is not used in, in, in these countries at a, at a level that we would have uh, you know, wanted. And as a result, the signal is, is rather weak uh, to, to, make, to use Twitter that effectively, at least at this point of time. And finally, we, we have studied uh, the potential spread of Ebola into Latin American countries because one of the conjectures or uh, the thought was that uh, you know, <clears throat> Ebola would spread into Latin American countries and through migrations and people moving into US, you might actually get a different route of, of this disease coming into US. So we wanted to study what the chances of such an event happening were. So you can see that these, these questions are, are very diverse requires a diverse team. Uh, we have over 70 folks in our lab, and uh, uh, the questions really are posed almost uh, every week on a Tuesday after our meeting is done. And they want answers uh, reasonably quickly. Uh, and as, a, as, a, as an academician, this is actually an interesting exercise where you try and come up with some solution that is meaningful, and then you hopefully can refine it. But you can't. You can't say you've got to wait for three months before I come up with an answer, because that's simply not something that, that works out in a situation like this. And I think uh, that has been a very good learning experience for us as, as a lab, uh, to be working on a problem as an event unfolds. Uh, and I think more and more use of such tools uh, will demand from policymakers uh, that you know, we sort of try and support them in real time. Um, we've set up a web page. Um, you know, the, the address is. Uh, is there uh, on my slides, and I think the slides are going to be posted, Andy, as I understand. Um, this web page was built out as a resource uh, for, for Ebola folks. Uh, it, is, it has got a lot of different pieces of information on it. Uh, we've built out uh, you know, da data uh, disease models and, and synthetic data for different countries. Papers have been put there. Uh, and we continue to post new new results and, and analysis that comes out. For instance, all the presentations we have done to our federal partners uh, have been put on these slides uh, with a few little bit of delay, uh, just to make sure that the slides slides are okay. And I, I encourage you folks to take a look at it. Another thing that is of interest, and I told this to to Yure when I talked to him in October, we ran a hackathon. Uh, we call it Hack Ebola in in around October. It probably was the first Ebola hackathon. Um, it was motivated by our students wanting to contribute to this project, and it was fairly successful. Uh, we had 60 odd students participating in it. Um, it was actually open to everybody outside. Um, got some projects done. We also faced some challenges, and challenges in terms of getting the right teams to work together was not straightforward. Um, one of our students, Caitlin Rivers, was actually a, a key contributor. In fact, she was the one who coordinated this. So, and I. I think an uh, exercise like this, where students from various uh, backgrounds come together to solve a problem uh, of, of importance, is, I think is, is interesting. And I think uh, something that we probably will do again in spring, because I think this problem is not going to go away anytime soon. And I encourage students here and uh, uh, other places to participate when this happens. And after our hackathon, there are multiple uh, agencies and universities that have also uh, done it. 
uh, with varying degrees of success. Uh, it again, as I said, depends on the problems you pose, uh, the, the diversity of the teams uh, that is in place. And sometimes the problems are not solvable in a day or two. You know, you require solutions uh, which take a little bit of time. So this is a challenge that folks face. So let me move to now the meat of the talk and try to describe to you uh, the mathematics behind it and at least give you some sense. So traditionally, uh, mathematical epidemiology uh, worked with a class of models called mass action uh, compartmental models. And the term mass action means that you assume uh, 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 an interaction between po populations and individuals really are assumed to be identical in, in some form. And compartmental in this case says that there are three basic compartments. The basic models really were uh, motivated from uh, chemical reactions and people studying uh, you know, physical systems. And uh, a very early version of it, not called this way, was used by uh, Daniel Bernoulli when he talked about variolation uh, for controlling smallpox in France. You know, he basically was trying to argue that um, in, you know, variolation, which is the act of taking active smallpox from a person who is infected and essentially in, in, in vac vaccinating somebody is a, actually a good thing because although there, there's a chance that somebody is going to fall sick and fairly severely, it protects, provides herd immunity to the larger population. And he did calculations which resemble this. And there's a very nice article by Sally Blower uh, on, on this topic that uh, folks here might be interested in reading. So the simplest model has three compartments. And this is the most elementary model. This was formalized in, in early 1900s by Ross and then uh, Kermick and McKendrick, and then uh, by others, uh, where in, in this particular setting, you have uh, compartments which sus uh, denote susceptible individuals, infected individuals, and recovered individuals. And think of them as really chemical reactions or molecules uh, if, for, for these purposes. And then you talk about uh, you know, interactions between these compartments. So you say the rate of change of folks who are uh, moving out of the susceptible compartment, you know, the mass essentially, to the infected is directly proportional to the uh, to, sorry. Directly proportional to the product of the, the, the size of the com eye compartment, the number of infected individuals and number of susceptible individuals, right? Um, you also have a, re a reaction, if you want to call it an equation, which tells you the rate of change of the compartment which are infected individuals. So there, the incoming, you know, particles or individuals from S compartments are from the previous term, and then you have a rate of outflow, uh, and the rate is gamma in this case. People recover at a rate of gamma, essentially. And then you have the last equation, which says that people recover at the rate of gamma, and that's, that's the last equation here. And that's a very, very clean, simple formulation of the problem, but has been effective, very, very effective for, for you know, for a long time. The kinds of things you study from this are, uh, are epidemic quantities, things which is called an epidemic curve, which tells you the time when you see the peak of an epidemic, the, the time that the length of the epidemic, uh, the time when it takes off, which means you see a sudden jump in, in the curve. Uh, these are formally defined terms. Uh, you can look it up in, in the books. Uh, but this simple model actually has been immensely successful over the last 100 years. And the workhorse for epidemiologists uh, effectively was used by uh, Ross and others to, to control malaria uh, when they were able to effectively argue from these models how you might want to control malaria in the Western world. Uh, it's very easy to extend, add new compartments to it. It's easy to, to code if you want in, in today's MATLAB style codes. And I think one of the reasons this became powerful and useful early on was that you could have come up with analytical solutions. In, in the early 1900s, there were no computers. And that's my conjecture of why a different class of model that I'm going to talk about never really took hold. And it's because people wanted analytically closed form solutions. There was no use of coming up with a representation theory, which could not really be solved very well. You know, you wanted to write the problem in a form that you could come up with solutions for. Uh, and I think computers have changed that. This, although the models have been very powerful, they also have some weaknesses. For instance, they do not represent the heterogeneity that, that is 
inherent in social systems, right? And all of us are not identical. So this this heterogeneity that exists in our in, a, in urban set, you know, in 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 social systems is is not represented very well. You can of course keep on breaking these things into smaller and smaller compartments, but then you sort of lose the appeal of the model in the first place. Um, the other aspect is representing of human behavioral issues is is quite hard in, in this system like this. And finally, uh, models like this, it's not straightforward to come up with what I would call implementable strategies for interventions. And hopefully, I'll be able to give an example in the later part of the talk. So what's an alternative approach? The alternative approach is uh, now called networked epidemiology. And some of you here actually have uh, written papers on this topic um, in, in different context. But the basic hypothesis here is that a better understanding of the social contact structure and individual behaviors is likely to give improved insights into how the, the disease spreads or the contagion spreads. I'll use the word contagion and disease uh, synonymously here and allow us to cover better response strategies, right? And that's a hypothesis. I Hopefully, I'll be able to convince you that this, this hopefully holds. And uh, the basic, basic model is very, very simple. Uh, here's a cartoon for it. You have four nodes um, in this. It's a graph, it's a network. Um, the disease starts at node one, and uh, you toss a coin, uh, and the node one tries to infect node two and node three uh, with probability p independently. In this particular case, node three gets infected, node two did not get infected. Um, and let's say in this particular model, node one recovers after one time unit. In the next step, three tries to infect two and four. In this case, it's successful infecting two, but unsuccessful infecting four, uh, and it recovers. And then two tries to infect four, is not successful. And you can write down the probability of this event happening. The probability is P, P13, which is a chance that one sends a disease on the edge, 13, multiplied by one minus P12, which is a chance that you know, one was unsuccessful in infecting two, and on and on and on. So you can write the probability of this particular event, this particular configuration playing out, right? And this is the basic model. You can now add incubation times um, and so on and so forth. But this is actually an interesting, simple model that can capture uh, a discrete time process, an abstraction of the problem of disease spreading. Now, of course, the problem, which I'll, I'll come down later and tell you is, uh, there are issues that come up with this model too. You know, it's not like this is a panacea for 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 the for the problems I talked about from for OD based models or mass action models. A way to abstract this out even further, and I think it's a useful way to do it, and that's how we have actually developed all our work, is to view this as as a graphical dynamical systems. So, uh, folks here are now hopefully uh, you know well aware of two class of graphical models that have been used heavily in computer science literature. One is the graphical models for inference, uh, which were popularized and have been very successful in, over the last 10 years. And then graphical models of games. Uh, what I'm proposing is that you can also have a graphical model for dynamical systems. And it's just an abstraction of the process that I described before. The abstraction says that you, instead of having the simple coin toss and edge, you have a local function on each edge which tells you how you would change your state by looking at your own state and the neighbor's state. And the function could be either deterministic or probabilistic. And you can run this synchronously, and you can think of this as computing a global function, which is obtained by composing these local functions together. Right? This abstraction works out very well. You can decide to have, as I said, a deterministic local function or a probabilistic one, and that will change the dynamics. Um, what is interesting, then, is that Many, many interesting epidemiological questions can be cast as combinatorial problems on this graphical dynamical systems. And that's how you do the mapping. Hopefully, you solve them well and then have something to say about the policy back. Uh, for instance, the question of inference, that, and, and we just talked to Bruno here in the afternoon, can be cl you know, classified in the, in the setting where you say that you have observer time series in this dynamical system, and you're trying to infer the graph that might have led to this particular uh, uh, time series. You talk about forecasting in the following manner. You say that disease starts from some place, and then you want to understand how the disease would spread and what the state of the disease would be after some time unit. You can talk about interventions in this, which is changing the properties of the vertices in terms of functions or edges 
to try and control the pandemic or epidemic, right? So the problem is that from a computational standpoint, uh, all this is good, but you're actually trying to reason about an object that is substantially larger than the, than the representation itself. But in, in, in particular, in this particular setting, the phase space, which is the representation of the possible dynamical outcomes, is exponentially larger. In a, in when your local functions are probabilistic, it turns out a good representation of is a Markov chain. And people have interesting algorithms to analyze Markov chain. The problem with this situation is that the Markov chain is exponentially larger than the representation itself. So that causes sort of computational difficulties. Uh, and I've tried to sort of articulate this here. Um, the other problem in, 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 this, in this form of modeling is that, well, how would you even come up with a representation of a social contact network if you want to study, say, flu in a city or Ebola in, in Liberia, right? So mathematically, you have a network and you have this spread, but you really don't have any way of measuring this network in the real world. In fact, my, I, I would argue that there's no way that you can ever get an exact representation of this network by endless measurements. This is just impossibility, right? So you have to synthesize these networks. The other problem that you face is that you basically have actually grown the computational uh, burden on yourself a huge amount. The other models are relatively simple. These models become extremely hard to, to work with, right? So the next hypothesis then is that our advances in HPC and, and, and data science can actually help us solve these problems. And, uh, and again, what we've done is we have tried to build a program called Simdemics, which tries to take this representation theory of networks, combines with HPC simulations, uh, with machine learning algorithms, and a way to synthesize these networks to try and, and address important policy questions. I'll give you a couple of examples of it here. Uh, along with it, you got to build a, a middleware which you can allow these models to be useful by the end users. And that's where you come to the third hypothesis, which is that you know, to make this program successful, you want to be able to push the models to end users in a rather seamless manner. Uh, we had done another project uh, almost 10 years back on urban transport planning, and it was actually very successful in some ways, but did not uh, find traction in, in the policy world. And we learned the hard way that we built very cool models, at least we thought were cool models, but really were made to be used by computer scientists. And they had no interest in becoming computer scientists. And uh, from, from then on, we've learned that if you want to really take it to the policy makers or domain users, you got to really build systems that they can understand and play with, uh, you know, with no desire to convert them into computer scientists. And I think this is a message that we have learned the hard way, and I think uh, it's been successful work for us. So we have built out more than 15 apps. There's around 12 here that I can see, uh, but 15 different web apps, which allow users to play with these backend models that are complicated, but in a way that they don't realize that these models are being used in this form. Right, so specifications are clear, and I'll give you some examples of, of these models. So um, I'll, I'll start going a little faster. I realize that uh, uh, you know we should stop in about half an hour or so. Uh, so I'll describe this program in five steps. Uh, you will construct a, a, a synthetic population for the disease, and then uh, have a disease model, uh, come up with simulations, and then do analysis. And I'll, I'll give you examples of it. Uh, I think the hardest part here to begin with is the construction of the network, and I think it has got multiple uses beyond epidemics. The basic idea is we want to synthesize a social contact network to study epidemics in a city, right? Uh, so for instance, we have actually synthesized a social contact network to study flu in, uh, in Chicago. Uh, what does this network have? To go back to our model, each node represents an individual. Uh, and uh, what you want is that the edges between nodes have to reflect the interaction between these nodes. Uh, and the method that we have used is, is a first principle approach. What it means that is that you use a combination of data-driven techniques, uh, use machine learning and statistical algorithms, combined with social and behavioral theories to synthesize it. Because there is no way I can 
get an exact representation of the network in, in Chicago. Um, this data you get is, you, have, you know, it, you have to process is very large. It's a really interesting big data problem. The papers outline why this is the case. Just to give you a sense, uh, you know, you can get, uh, in our case, uh, Chicago network has over 11 million nodes and, um, and an average degree of 50, and you can compute the number of edges in this network itself. So the way we build this network out is a, is a series of steps um, using, I would say, a large number of different data sets uh, from census to Dun & Bradstreet to data about schools, colleges, health units, uh, to data about activity patterns that people have on a day-to-day -day basis from transport planning offices. Uh, these data sets are fused together to build out a, a detailed social contact network. Uh, and this actually started with our work back in, in, in transport planning. New, there are new data sets that are actually making this uh, somewhat easier and I would say interesting. Uh, so Barabashi and his group has used phone records. Other groups have done it as well. Some folks have started to use uh, Twitter data. Uh, Foursquare was used before to sort of map movement patterns, which can be used in this. The key in this network is two folds. One is that this network is synthetic, which means if I build a network for Chicago, uh, you cannot identify any person directly in, in my network. At the same time, it's statistically uh, very similar to the kind of network you might get in a place like Chicago. And how do we measure it? If you take a block group in Chicago and you look at any census variable for that block group, that would match the census that you would get for our population. So it's a synthetic population. Uh, there's one-to-one -one correspondence between people in Chicago and in, in our population. No direct mapping, but statistically identical, right? And we've done a fair amount of work to try and convince folks that this is a statistically accurate representation. I also want to say that this is not a, not a program that is going to end anytime soon. As you get more and more data sets, you can improve this population. But what is good about it is it really is designed at, at the get-go to preserve privacy and, and keep, keep the anonymity of, of, of the individuals. Um, the second thing is these networks are actually dynamic and relational, which is very useful when we do this modeling that we talked about. So in this representation, we have people on one side and locations on the other side. People carry a range of attributes, all the attributes that they have measured in the census surveys, age, income, uh, household size, uh, gender, and on, so on and so forth. And the locations have attributes such as the, you know, what sort of folks work there, how many people typically are there in that locations, uh, other building codes that go with it. And what do the edges represent? They represent activities. So a person A might visit a location B at a particular time. This person might then go to location C at between uh, another at a time and on and on. And now you have a basic structure which, from which you can build out a contact network. You can say, and you have to make it this inductive hypothesis saying that if people for flu, for instance, if people are in the same location for a particular period of time, then I would put a interacting edge between them. And this is a matter of convention, right? Uh, if it's uh, a different disease, uh, not aerosol-borne disease, the notion of an edge changes. Uh, this is a, sort of a canonical representation from which you can derive the interaction structure based on the disease itself. Uh, they're very large. This is the numbers that I have for Chicago. Eight million odd people when we first made it, now almost 10 uh, million plus locations, and edges that are changing in time and have relational attributes on it. We build a tool called SIV. It's actually available on the web. You can you know, look at the population synthesized this way and disaggregate it. And you can sort of take a look at it. It will carry all the information that I've talked about. Um, uh, allows us to explain to uh, you know, policy makers this, this aspect of, uh, of synthetic information visualization. We then build disease progression models. We use uh, machine learning techniques to uh, look at data that one gets from limited experiments and the data people capture uh, in small households and try to assess disease parameters for within host transmission. We then do simulations of how the disease would spread 
through these networks. And we have had to use uh, high performance computing platforms to do it. It has been a challenge over the last eight years as we have done this to scale up to, a, to large populations and networks. When we first did this back in 2002, uh, we were studying Portland and uh, it used to take us uh, 24 hours to, to get even a single run together in a meaningful way. We can do this now much, much faster. And I've put some numbers here because I find them interesting. Uh, it's a piece of work that uh, my student and, and col uh, colleagues have done uh, uh, about trying to scale this uh, for US, the complete US, 300 million nodes and approximately 15 billion interactions uh, on, a, on the largest open science HPC machine we have, the Blue Waters at UIUC. And you can essentially do one run now over 200 days of epidemic simulation in about 30 seconds, okay? Uh, and it, you know, of course, as computer scientists, it's fun to do that, but I think from a policy standpoint, this is needed because if you want to do large experimental designs and counterfactual experiments, you really need to make multiple runs. So first thing, they are stochastic models, so you need to get multiple replicates. And then if you want to do intervention analysis, you want to actually try and uh, study many, many different cells in a factorial design to understand this problem. I had this movie, which I will try and play if it plays, uh, where we did a study and it will show you a spatial spread of the disease. It's a slow moving disease, so it takes a little bit of time, but uh, effectively you will see how this lights up. Uh, we did this study for a senior level exercise where the disease started in Las Cruces, Mexico. It's the first red block and then it moves on uh, because of the folks moving through, uh, people had come in into the scenario from, from Mexico in it work and, and that's how the disease spreads. This particular study was done to assess the ready, readiness of our rural healthcare system, you know, uh, in terms of uh, hospital beds, in terms of face masks, in terms of ventilators, and what sort of coordination might be needed. Um, <clears throat> uh, let me give you two or three examples. There are more examples here of the kind of studies we have done. Uh, I've already described all the different things we have done for Ebola. But the other studies we are doing, have done, are actually much larger in scope. Uh, and I'll just take two examples and move to the next, next set of slides. Uh, the first study of, of note we did was, was uh, in fall 2003, when uh, we were asked by the Office of Homeland Security to study the potential effects of a smallpox release in, in, a, in, in a US city. And it turned out that, uh, Actually, there's a nice paper by Larry Vine and his colleagues from Stanford, and they'd argued for mass vaccinations using these uh, mass com uh, compartmental models. And I think the results were uh, very interesting, and I think made a, made a good point. Uh, but because the, the representation th theory itself, uh, the, the, argument, the final outcome was that if you don't do mass vaccinations, then you're not likely to control the disease very well. We found out using this network model for Portland, that um, you can actually get away without doing mass vaccinations uh, by doing early detection and, uh, and followed by a targeted vaccination strategy. And why is this important? Turns out that you know, uh, people in US are not vaccinated against smallpox, it's eradicated. Um, and the potential likelihood of getting vaccinia, which is a side effect of this vaccine, uh, is, is much worse than, the, than the, 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 if the, the terror attack itself that might have happened, right? So uh, we, don't, and we don't know that because we have not really vaccinated older people uh, you know, right now. We usually used to vaccinate kids. So, so while vaccination sounds like a good idea on the surface, it actually has a side effect that might actually be much larger than the, than the event itself, which is, which is something you want to study. Uh, this paper, this is published in, in, in Nature uh, Journal in, in 04. Uh, we uh, then did a study for uh, around the time that uh, H5N1 uh, was something that we were all worried about. And uh, our group, along with two other groups, uh, the group led by Ira Longini, at, uh, who used to be then at, at Seattle, and um, and Neil Ferguson, who is at in, uh, in Imperial College, uh, did a study. And the interesting part of the study was three different models were used. 
but uh, the concept of targeted layer in containment was, was developed as a part of this and was outlined in, in a federal pandemic influenza plan, uh, which is now used actually uh, to try and address the, the flu epidemic if, if it were to happen. And it talks about uh, layered containment. Okay, so yeah, I was going to ask a question if you were included H3N5, as well as the most recent things that you're in California now is welcome the measles as well too. Right, so we've not done measles yet, but we've certainly done H1N1 after that. We are, you know, just like Ebola, we, we participate in the federal you know, response, uh, but it lasted for a shorter time than the Ebola response. Um, and it has actually been, uh, each of these case studies are interesting because that's where we derive requirements for our modeling work and the mathematics we do and hopefully build better tools for the next round. Um, we are not prepared for certain class of diseases in our modeling systems, and I'll, I'll say that a little bit. But certainly we are much better prepared than 2003 right now to do these studies. Each of them finally results in papers, theses, uh, and mathematical advances uh, that are of interest. Um, let me quickly tell you about a, two projects. I'll start with the forecasting project. Uh, this is being done as a part of a f project that is funded by DTRA, the Threat Reduction Agency, and IRPA's OSI program. Uh, Narain Ramakrishnan is the PI for it, and it, the project that we are a part of is called Embers. And um, this is actually a more general project than just epidemics. We're trying to forecast all sorts of events, uh, elections, uh, social unrest, um, disease outbreaks, uh, not just flu, but rare diseases in uh, focus was to use open source indicators, which means only open data that is available to everybody to try and do this forecast. And our focus originally was in Latin America. Uh, this year we have moved into you know, Middle East uh, for, for understanding this, this, uh, these kind of things. This particular project is interesting because our team builds causal models, um, much more so, but the other team members are actually very good at building data-driven models. And we have taken data from all sorts of different places, from Google flu trends, search trends, weather data, places like table near, you know, table near you, which tells you about occupancy of hotels and cancellations. Um, uh, data from Twitter, health map, which John Brownstein maintains and is a very successful app, which uh, people have participated in. Flu near you, there's another app that he maintains. Uh, all these data sets are pulled together and we build out a forecasting model for each of the data sets and then combine these models in, in a composite way rather than first combining the data and then building a composite model. And we feel that is a better scale approach to scale as we get newer, newer and newer data sets. So these models are then put together using a, a statistical technique uh, which is motivated from topic modeling uh, and is used to generate forecasts. And it's a live system right now. We send forecasts for Latin America, I think 12 of the countries there, every week back to IARPA. And the forecasts are evaluated um, by a gold standard, as they call it. It's a data that they've collected. Uh, you know, IARPA, like DARPA, wants to have measurements to decide whether they're doing well or not. Um, so this, this goes on every week, and this is completely automated. There's no human in the loop right now. You can train the models, but you've got to get this forecasts automated completely so that they get these event triggers. Uh, and you're evaluated at the end of each, each week and told. We have also done ablation tests which tell you how good each data source is doing. Um, compare this with Google flu trends. Uh, we find that our models actually do quite, quite a bit well. Uh, in fact, many places in, Africa, uh, in, in, in Latin America don't even have Google flu trends working, at least when we were uh, doing work there. Uh, and we can forecast things like the count, the, the, the date of beginning of the season, uh, when it would end, the time of peak, the value at peak. Um, and and uh, the scoring is a GPS style scoring. You get a score of four if you do very, very well. And uh, otherwise you get something smaller. Uh, it turns out that there are three teams before. Our team did very well in the, in the first two years. And as it happens in, in these competitions, one team move forward, so our team has gone forward for third year, and we continue to do this forecast. The point is that these forecasts are evaluated in a fairly rigorous manner, which in itself is an interesting question. How do you build measurements to decide what forecasts are good? 
And I think this is not a solved problem at all. Uh, furthermore, uh, I think uh, that when you do these forecasts, what you measure about the, the system is also important. And finally, I think an important point to note, the gold standard we use for this work is a data called PAHO data. It's a, it's a data that public health authorities across Latin America put together and produce data sets for each country or many of the countries in South, in, in, in South America, in Latin America. But this, this PAHO data that is given to us only gives you number of cases that, uh, that the health authorities have measured, right? But there's an interesting sort of uh, pyramid in, in, in terms of what really happens in the real world. So you have a, 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 a set of folks, X, let's say, who are infected. Uh, a fraction of them, alpha times X, actually um, shows symptoms. Uh, another fraction, beta times alpha times X, actually feels you know, sick enough to report uh, that they want to go to the doctor, out of which another factor, gamma, actually is detected as having flu. So, you know, this notion of forecasting itself is fraught with difficulties because what we are trying to match is the final number that PAHO has given us. Uh, it might be way off in that particular setting than what the real ground truth is. And it's actually an open question uh, to try and estimate the incidence of flu in US, for instance, or any other country based on these measurements themselves. Um, but these, hopefully these forecasts will, will help us. Uh, we've started to do this forecast for other diseases as well, chikungunya and dengue. There's a competition that CDC ran last year. We participated in it. Jeff Shaman's group from Columbia won the competition. Uh, for forecasting flu in, in US. It did very, very well, actually. Um, uh, <coughs> we are, uh, there's a competition that DARPA is running right now for chikungunya, I believe, that we are, we are a part of. Um, and I think it's, it remains a, a question that, that is open and will, will be, you know, continue to be worked on for years to come. We built an app, uh, just like the previous apps, and I wanted to give you this example over and over again. It's called Flucaster for flu and epicaster for other diseases, where just like weather, you can actually go here and see the incidence of flu and our forecast. And uh, you can look at the current incidence rates and, and the numbers as, as time goes by, okay? Uh, you can sort of uh, get it down at the level of a block group, uh, uh, not block group, but a county in, in any part, you know, many regions in US and many other Latin American countries and Ebola is included in this as well now. We have another tool that allows humans to participate in it. It's not exactly crowdsourcing per se, but really humans become part of this decision-making process as citizen science scientists, where we show you forecasts and then we ask you to rank order them or modify them slightly so that we can, we can get input from citizen scientists uh, to Gosh. citizen scientists to, to show what the forecast might look like. This allows you to you know, collect more and more information that can then better inform our models. So I'll go to the last topic and then I'll stop. I'll give an example of the kinds of interventions we do. It's a classic problem. Uh, I've abstracted it out here because I think it will still give you a good sense of what the real problem is. This is a vaccine allocation problem, but you can make a problem on... on uh, antiviral allocation too, uh, something that is very basic to intervention analysis when you look at pharmaceutical interventions. So let's say you have resources, uh, which is in terms of vaccine this, in this case, uh, and are very limited quantities that are available to you. And you want to decide how to distribute these vaccines to get the best impact, right, to control the disease. Uh, it turns out that mathematically, this is a very hard problem. Um, you know, to add to it, the network changes, um, coming up with good strategies is probably problematic. Uh, a lot of papers have been written in epidemiology in trying to come up with good strategies for allocating vaccines. Uh, they're always usually in short supply for diseases when, when they sort of break out quickly, uh, like H1N1 uh, and others. <clears throat> so what we found out is that by using these simulations, we could come up with strategies based on a, a concept called vulnerability of a node. Basically, the idea that you run these simulations many times, see the node that is getting infected over and over again, 
use that as an estimator of probability that that node will be infected and then use that as a way to allocate vaccines. So you find the node with highest vulnerability or chance of getting sick and then assign these vaccines to these nodes. We found out doing this empirical analysis that this actually beats many, many uh, strategies that are, you know, were studied in the past. So it was a good news, but then here's the bad news. The problem is I really can't implement this strategy. So it was good news in terms of writing a paper, but really not an implementation implementable strategy in the real world, right? I cannot measure somebody's vulnerability in this form. So now we turn the question around as to how we can find correlates of this concept of vulnerability in, that we have mathematically abstracted to a measurable demographic property of individuals, because that's what you have some chance of implementing in practice. And we find that the total contact time uh, turns out to be a good estimator. We've actually compared it CDC strategies and previous strategies, which are age-based, and found out that they are comparable or actually do better in, in many, many cases uh, in terms of reducing the peak and, and uh, you know, decreasing the, 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 the epidemic value at, at peak, basically. So the, the basic idea here is that you can use these mathematical models to come up with optimal strategies uh, and convert them using uh, data mining tools and finding surrogates for them in the real world. And I think this basic concept is actually very general. And uh, that's where these tools are likely to play a bigger and bigger role in the coming years. Uh, and that's where you use uh, the, the kind of representations we have. We have built out another tool. Actually, this is a rather complicated tool. We've taken three years to build this out. It's called Sybil. Um, we, had, we had a paper in, in last KDD. Uh, we used to call it ISIS. We've changed the name for obvious reasons. Um, so, and it's a, it's a really interesting tool. It allows epidemiologists to set up a factorial cell design using our tool. Uh, you can choose a population. You can choose the interventions. Uh, you can choose the disease models. And you'll get these runs. You'll rank order the interventions. You can do factor analysis. And you can get the an an analytics produced by the, by the tool. And again, you can log on. You can get a guest user account on this. This, this particular tool is interesting because we've been able to do many, many different studies. So we've been able to train many, many policymakers now um, to use this. And it takes about four hours to train in a classroom session. And they can start using it and with a little bit of consultation from us. Again, the idea being that we do not want to be doing these studies over and over again. Uh, the value of these tools will be best uh, uh, seen when others start using the tools. Uh, uh, the the Flucaster and other tools are actually very simple. You don't need any training. It was specifically designed that everybody can use it. This is a little bit more complicated, so it requires a little bit of training uh, to use it. So let me summarize. It's uh, close to 5.15 so that we can take questions. One is I hope I've convinced you that public health epidemiology is a complex systems problem and that uh, Controlling and responding to pandemics is going to be challenging. Uh, and that <coughs> epidemics, the social networks, and behaviors are all co-evolving at the same time, which makes the problem of coming up with good solutions that much harder and very different than typical physical system. And I think that the advances in big data and computing really offer us a qualitatively very different way to formulate policies and respond to epidemics than we have ever done before, ever done before in the past. Uh, the tools that we have built out and I discussed and many others are now being used by folks on the ground in the case of Ebola. And uh, although they, they have their fits and starts, we think that every such event helps us refine these tools that uh, folks who are on the ground, epidemiologists, but also first responders can better use these tools and try and, and control epidemics in the future. So I'll, I'll stop here and take questions. Uh, here are some uh, references. Uh, we did a tutorial at KDD last year. I put a website, it's, it's fairly comprehensive. It lasted for four hours. Uh, it's got a lot of material there. There's a article we wrote in CSCM with my colleagues, um, which gives you an overview of it. 
And then the web pages that I've described also contain a fair bit of information. For instance, we have the synthetic network for Liberia, Sierra Leone, and uh, Guinea placed on our web. Anybody who is interested in just network science here, and I met quite a few people today who are interested in it, can take this as networks, just like uh, social networks that you have played with to do analysis. The difference is these networks have labels on them, so they're relational and time varying. So you can do other kinds of analysis that you might not have done on some other networks that you're used to. So thank you very much. I um, appreciate you listening to this, and I'll take any questions. Yes. So, <coughs> excuse me. Now that your software is all whatever shape it's in, uh, if Ebola were to start over again, how many people does it take to put in the data? Uh, that's a that's a good question. If you know, if it starts in a completely new country, we'll have to build out these synthetic networks for that country. Uh, I forgot to mention that we have a big project underway where by end of this year, we would have actually built out a synthetic representation of a large portion of, of the world. Once we do that, for diseases that we have seen before, flu and Ebola, uh, we've done work on MERS, we've done some work on pertussis, uh, would be substantially easier. But we get a new emerging disease. Uh, it might take, again, uh, much more time. But I think we have we've been able to do much better job after every round uh, than in the past. So I don't know where the fixed point of this system is, uh, but hopefully it'll take lesser and lesser time than in the past. Can you give a ballpark of how many people it, it takes to add a new country then? Um, it's a good question. When we first built out, um, it used to take almost a year with 30 of us to build out a country of the size of, uh, you know, uh, with say, 50 million people. Uh, now it takes much less time because we've automated that process too. Some of the time it takes is to find right data sources. Uh, there's no clean way that this is this can be done yet. We are hoping that when we put these populations out, others will join us in, in this effort, just like OpenStreetMaps project. We hope that this will become a project of the same kind. We'll put these populations out and then people can contribute data sets and in fact help us refine some of these countries better. So I think this is a project that will go on for a while and we, we strongly feel that it will get better in, in time uh, and we'll start seeing good results at the end of this year itself. Yeah. Where do you see the big breakthroughs over the next year too? In terms of tool making or in terms of yeah, just either tool making or modeling or determining what the difference is between your mirror world and the actual world? and how you're modeling that sample error? Right, I think uh, a big breakthrough is going to come through these you know, pervasive apps because it's going to start allowing us to do measurements in the field that we have never been able to do before. Behavioral representations, sentiments. A lot of epidemic outbreaks really depend on how people perceive the disease. So in Liberia, um, you know, the cultural practices were, are such that it was very hard to control the disease early on. But once people believed the authorities uh, at some level, this became you know, the problem. I mean, it's not in control, but it's in a, under substantial control than we saw in October. It was raging and numbers are likely to be bad. So I think these apps are likely to have a large impact, in my opinion. The second place that this is going to help us is to understand uh, what's called the phylodynamics. We really want to do this wherein when the disease starts, you can actually start building vaccines whenever applicable. Some disease you know, vaccines are not the right thing to do. But pharmaceutical interventions have eventually always helped us control the disease. And I think they require lead time. And uh, in our case, because we started work with uh, DITRA, who is responsible for building vaccines out, uh, these forecasts and uh, and and and, uh, and things related to disease are helpful. So the early earlier information you can get from the field, the better chances you have uh, to give you some sense of flu vaccines. This year, for instance, the flu vaccine has been not very successful. And the way it gets made, approximately speaking, is that you collect samples all over the world, you put it in a large sort of bag of mixed possible strains, 
and then you build a you know a vaccine around it. So you're constantly collecting data. Uh, this process of collecting data, building out the automated facilities on on the, on the medical side, uh, is actually going to have a big breakthrough. And Barda is actually ramping up and building capacity to do it as well. So something will come from biology side, and I think some will come from the from the modeling side. Yeah. You're not biologists, so you actually don't care about some of the things that are coming up. Have you tried applying this to other problems, or as people trying to other problems, such as computer viruses with the network topology is completely different, or completely different problems like, can you stop the next Justin Bieber outbreak? <laughs> now, the second one, I'm sure I cannot. Uh, nobody can. The first one is an interesting, so, but yes, I think I take your point. So in general, the, the, the methods that I've outlined are fairly generic, you know? Uh, they will work with different networks. They will work with different models of what we'll call a disease, to the extent you call it a disease. Uh, uh, you know, so viruses on, on computer also have disease-like signatures. You know, there's a chance that you can infect. In fact, they call it, uh, you know, uh, uh, use the word epidemics in, in, in that sense too. In fact, there's a nice article called Internet Epidemiology that has come out. One of my students just finished his PhD on malware propagation in wireless devices where people can move around. And we used essentially a similar idea there to understand how you could spread viruses and the impact of, of these viruses when you have a hybrid network where you have a normal you know, wireline network, but then people carry their devices. And you know, nowadays, these devices can talk to each other as, they, as you walk by. So you can certainly use it. There's another area, though, I think that you might uh, find of, of interest, which is non-communicable diseases. So smoking and obesity are good examples. Uh, more and more evidence that, uh, you know, these are habits, uh, in, in smoking as a habit uh, has a lot to do with the social network itself. We still, it's an open debate about the causality aspect of it, but the social network representation, representation of how access, accessible uh, these, th these things are to youngsters and uh, deciding how you might be able to curtail habits uh, for smoking might have a significant impact. So I think that's a, that's a very good example. Obesity is another example where I think this, this can be applied in the health sciences. You had a question? Oh, I, was, I was just wondering, um, since you must have analyzed a whole lot of social contact networks by now, and I was wondering if you found any common characteristics to these, in these social contact networks, and if there are particular characteristics of a social contact network that would give rise to a pandemic. I mean, a high-degree distribution of the Right, I say it's a good question. Uh, first, we find that these are actually not very well modeled by typical random, simple random graph models. And that's why we started doing this generative process of building these networks out bottom up. Um, they have a power loss style degree distribution in in some regimes, but uh, but uh, they have other additional structure which really uh, makes them quite unique. So they seem to follow three or four basic properties that others have measured as well. So power loss style degree distributions in many cases, uh, high clustering coefficient in many cases. Um, they have a fairly high con you know conductance. So in the, the, the it's low diameter. And uh, as a result, uh, all these properties make it very easy to, for the disease to spread through fast. Uh, and the similar properties are measured for other networks as well. So these are not the only ones. But we do find interesting differences between, say, this kind of proximity network, if I may call, versus a Facebook site social network, which is about friends. Uh, the degrees there are much, much larger than you know, degrees that you get here, because um, we're talking about not friendship networks as much, but proximity networks, and proximity has to be defined with respect to a disease. Uh, you know, smallpox, you got to be prox you know, in proximal distance of a person for a very long period before you can transmit the disease. Flu, maybe not that long a period. But even with that, you know, you still don't get a network with degree to be that high, um, usually. What would you think about um, having a smaller network, people simulating? disease spread in a smaller network, what should be the characteristics of the disease? 
my general sense is we don't understand these networks well enough to use simple random graph models of that kind. I don't, I'm not saying it won't happen, but the structure in this is, is there's a lot of internal structure to these networks. We have done uh, in a study that might actually help explain this a little bit. We took this network and do a sensitivity analysis. Uh, and one way to do this is to try and perturb this network in a local manner. We find that initially the networks, the epidemic characteristics are actually uh, of a particular kind. But as you do this perturbation over a long period of time, the network starts looking like a model network which is generated by say a Chunglu like process of, of uh, simple you know, uh, matching of, of, these, uh, of these vertices. But those epidemic characteristics are very, very different than one observes in, in the real world. Uh, so what the structure is, is, is not clear. It certainly seems to have a recurring feed uh, to it, which is in terms of diameter, degrees, clustering, expansion. We do find subtle differences between, say, network in one city with network in another city. Uh, initially, we thought if we build out a few cities, that would be plenty. Uh, we find that, no, it's, it's quite different. The demographics are very different. So even the structure might be similar. The labels are very different. So Portland and Seattle has roughly the same, you know, Seattle and Miami, sorry, has roughly the same population size, roughly. And it turns out that the, you know, we did a very detailed study and we got very similar results in terms of the epidemics in both places. But the reasons were very, very different. Uh, one had a, a larger family size, in, in, which is in Miami, while the number of kids were much more in, in, in Seattle per, you know, per household and, and on average. And they sort of balanced out to get similar characteristics at the end, but they really were different networks to begin with. And I don't think so we understand these differences. We just finished a network for New Delhi. Um, we find again that is a very different network, very densely populated network. Um, we have started representing uh, slums in it, which are a very important component to it. Uh, so, so I think these networks are going to differ right now. I think it will take us some time to figure out these differences. And we are going to put it out for people to take a look at it. Have you thought about adding crazy variables that you can reliably capture, like payday, phase of the moon, cold temperature, stuff that is a... Uh, Stand for kiss on the quad there. <laughs> something, yeah. Things that, would, that you might not think to put in, but just to see what impact they might have. No, we haven't done that, and it's it's a question that we can we can take up. We also haven't we have only produced what we we'll call normative networks on a typical day, right? We haven't produced networks that happen during a big event, a football game, for instance, or a big rally that happens in Washington, or seasonal changes. You know, Washington D.C. is very different in summers versus winter. There are so many visitors coming in, so we have really created one template for a city, but there's nothing that's not it's a, it's an abstraction for the time being. You really want these networks to be a live object so that depending on the time of the year, uh, an event that is happening, uh, the disease you're studying, the network will look different. It really has to be tailored for the particular context. And we are not there yet. We are, this is almost the first, first uh, cookie cutter way, much better cookie cutter than, uh, than a typical any like graph or a, uh, power law uh, like graph, but nevertheless still a, a cookie cutter style network that we have built out. Uh, I think it'll take years to, to refine it. And I think you asked the question of what advances can be made. And I think as these devices and apps proliferate, we might get more and more information to improve the quality of these networks in real time. Okay.